which is fift it's fifteen fifty now in my clock. We good? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, this is about uh, PG Logical three and BDR three and the work that uh, we have been doing on those projects. I'm Peter Eisenschaut. I work for Second Quadrant. I'm a Postgres developer, Postgres committer, and if you want to reach me, and you can read that down there, you can contact me there. Let's see if this is on. So, last year I was here talking about the work we've been doing in uh, core Postgres 10 on logical applications. So this is not about that. This is about these external uh, uh, projects and products. Um, so in, in, in that sense, this talk is, is informative about what we have been doing and what these uh, products can do for you. But this, this being a, a sort of also a developer conference, I guess there's a sort of second aspect of you know, showing and introducing some of the technology that exists around logical application in Postgres that you know, currently exists in, in some of these other uh, projects. But we had, a, we had an unconference session uh, uh, yesterday where we, you know, been talking about some, you know, what should we do in Postgres core and, and, and these things. And so, you know, some of that technology is already in existence in some of these uh, projects and products. So this is also, if you're sort of a developer who's interested in this, you can also take a look at, uh, you know, some of that existing code or, or, or build on, on some of that existing code if you're interested in that. So it has maybe both of these aspects in this talk. So just to clarify what, this is really. So there are currently sort of three tracks or three sibling code bases that, maybe more, but this is sort of what I'm aware of, right? Three sibling code bases of logical application around Postgres. Uh, the, the first one that came into existence around, uh, or was started around Postgres 9.2, 9.3 era was BDR, bidirectional replication, which I'll talk about at the end of this talk. Uh, so that, that was a, a project to develop a multi-master replication system on Postgres. And a lot of that work that originally came out of the BDR fork has been uh, merged into Postgres over time and, and some well-known features such as logical decoding, replication slots, uh, event triggers, and, and, and some things like that came out of that. Uh, the intention and what was and continues to be to eventually merge all that into core, but you know the community processes are, are very particular, and so that all, all has to be you know a lot of development originally happens in, in these extensions and then then sort of trickled back, which you know which is why there's the, these different tracks exist. So around Postgres 9.6, what uh, the desire was to have some kind of logical application in Postgres core. So what was done is to basically take BDR and strip it down to the sort of the minimum viable product in a way. And that was submitted as, uh, PG, uh, as a contrib module at the time, uh, PG logical to Postgres 9.6, uh, but it was not I accepted. Uh, mostly for the reasons that people didn't want it to be an extension, but wanted to be even more built in. And that then caused the, um, effort in Postgres 10 to essentially take the PG logical code and morph it into something that's more built in is what we and that's what we have now with create publication create subscription but the the code you know and, and some of the people who worked on this are it's so it's all very similar internally right but there are sort of three separate code bases at the moment so again I'm not going to talk about the built-in uh, logical application facilities in this talk much, except sort of by reference. Uh, that is last year's talk, and it's recorded somewhere, right? So PG Logical is a, a, a plugin. It's a technically an extension uh, to Postgres that provides logical application. OK, so that's basically what it does. There's some URLs. It's on GitHub. It's open source. There's also kind of a, a company or a commercial page. It supports all major Postgres versions back to 9.4, which is when logical decoding was introduced. So it, it can't be used for anything before that, but it supports all other major versions. And it will also continue to support in upcoming versions. 
And just to kind of see, how, you know, what does it look like? It, it should be you know, pretty straightforward and familiar. You have to set the wall level to logical. You have to load the uh, shared library. And, and then you're good to go, essentially. There's some optional settings that uh, sort of will make sense later. If you want to do stuff with conflict resolution, you there's, there's you know, a set, again, I'll tell later what these dots are here, but you can basically set a conflict resolution mechanism. And if you want to do conflict resolution on based on timestamps, uh, you, you have to set commit track commit timestamp on, which is, which is a, a feature in core Postgres that you might have seen mentioned here and there, but it has no real application in core Postgres, so, but it is used by these replication plugins. Okay, then you create an extension, and uh, actually also the create extension cascade feature also came, was sort of, was uh, submitted by uh, people associated with the PG Logical project to make that kind of thing simpler. So create an extension, and then you can set up stuff. So it's, it's, it's similar, but I guess a little bit more complicated than the stuff that we have built in here. You first have to create a node with some connection information. I mean, it's not like shocking, right? Like many replication systems work like that, but you have to do a little bit more work to name the nodes, okay? And then you create a replication set, which is in core Postgres called a publication, but it's effectively the same thing. So and this is all as functions instead of DDL commands, but it's the same idea, right? You, you create, you add some tables to it, you can also add sequences, so PG Logical supports sequences, uh, sequence replication, which is not supported in uh, Core Postgres yet. And then there's some other stuff like dropping and alter and add some table, move some table, all that usual stuff. There's just a bunch of functions for that. Again, this is it, just like a publication. This doesn't do much except sort of create some catalog structures on the on the uh, provider. And then on the other end, that's where the real action happens, is that you create a subscription. In this term, the, term is the, the terminology is exactly the same. So you have a subscription, the name, some connection information should look very familiar if you play with uh, create subscription. You tell it what replication set you want to do, and then there's some additional options of uh, synchronizing data. Synchronized data is what Postgres Core also supports. What PG Logical can actually also do is synchronize the structure, which means that it can create the tables for you, right? So if you have a replication set, uh, you know, table, but we have table one and sequence one here, and you create the subscription and you tell it to synchronize the structure, it will take a, you know, it will just create those tables. That does not mean that there is full DDL replication support. It will just do it initially. So it's just an aid to, to sorry, what was that a question? No, sorry. It's just an aid to kind of get you started. And this is the kind of functionality, you know, that is quite useful in practice and, and customers want that. But submitting something like that to core, if you were to see how that is done, would probably not be acceptable. So this is why the, having these sort of outside of core facilities is occasionally useful to get that kind of stuff done. And, and then there, again, you know, there's disable and enable and, changing all of these things, there's functions to drop things. It, it's very standard. And at that point, once you do that, background worker starts running and do the synchronization and then do the apply. Very similar to how core Postgres works. Okay, and then there's uh, an endless amount of catalogs and, and views you can look at to see these things. And it's actually, I kind of complained a little bit that this is a bit too much now. So there are some obvious ones like, okay, the node information is stored in the catalog, it's called node. And the subscription information is stored in the catalog called subscription and stuff like that. The actual sort of logical decoding and, and wall shipping is exactly the same as all you know, how core Postgres worked and how physical application works. So these standard views, you will use the exact same views on the sending side. Yeah, you see your wall senders in PGSAT replication and also other things we have now. PG stat activity even and all that, right? And, and you see the replication slot, so that's exactly the same. And then on the receiving end, there's just a bunch more, a bunch more stuff to, to see, you know, how far has the initial sync come, what's the current status of the subscription, and is there, are there any problems, and, and things like that. So there's just a bunch of things that one doesn't have to 
memorize. So one uh, or a couple of sort of extra features that PG Logical supports is uh, as a column filter, so you can tell it to only replicate a subset of columns, which on occasion is quite nice if you wanna, only want to take a part of the table to maybe some, some kind of archiving or analytics uh, platform. You don't want to do just a one-to-one -one replication, so you can just tell it just take these columns, and that's fine. It's pretty straightforward. And then, so column filters, and you can also do row filters, which uh, you give an expression, and it filters those out. So again, maybe for some reason you want to filter out certain things that you don't want to archive or something like that. And there is a, some of you might have seen, there is a patch proposed for core Postgres to, to implement row filtering. And uh, Petr Jelinek has actually volunteered to review that, so he, he has implemented that, and, and so he'll, he'll review that. So that's the kind of thing so that, you know, eventually we want to trickle those features back into, into core Postgres if they have sort of achieved a certain amount of stability. All right, and then there's conflict resolution, which does not exist in core Postgres at the moment. Right now, in core Postgres, if you, if the subscription application results in a, an error of any kind, including a unique constraint violation or something like that, you just get an error, and you will kind of have to fix that manually. Uh, you know, it's just not ideal, but that's just sort of the minimum viable product at the time. There are, uh, in PG Logical, a, a variety of options, some of which we talked about yesterday, so all of these are, are available. Basically, around you can do the error if you want, it's usually not useful, or the most useful in practice, or either you apply the remote change, overriding a local change. So basically, it, if you if you have this sort of default setting that you just have one node you write to and you copy that to another node, any local changes you do w would be overwritten in that case if they conflict. Or you can do it the other way around. I don't know if that's useful. And then the, uh, if you want to do it by timestamp, you can use these two settings, and you will have to do the commit time, commit timestamp tracking option enabled for that. Right, so you can change those. And there's a global setting for this, and in PG Logical 3, you can also do it per subscription. Uh, this is kind of neat. This is a program that PG Logical ships with, um, which helps set, setting up a subscription. So if you want to, if you have this sort of um, common case that you want to basically replicate everything, the way to do that would be to set up. You know, you have a you create a replication set including all the tables. There's a shortcut to do that. You don't have to add, add all the tables. So you set up a replication set, and then you set up a subscription, and the subscription has to start re initially syncing every single table, which is slow and also has some robustness <coughs> issues. And so it's a very sort of time-consuming and, and, and slightly fragile process. There, there is this facility by which you can take a physical base backup, and then it, this kind of then goes into and converts it to a logical subscriber. So it kind of goes through, sees what all the tables are, sets up a subscription, fixes up the replication slot, converts them from a physical to a logical application slot. Doesn't convert them, kind of makes a new one and uh, adjusts everything. So there's, there's a bit of magic going on, but it's all, you know, it's an external program, it's in user space, it doesn't do any poking around where it shouldn't be. This is all kind of a, just basically a, a, a giant, you know, it's not. It's a C program, but you can think of this as a sort of a, a giant shell script that does useful things. So that's kind of a neat thing to to set up a, a subscriber much faster and easier. So, new in PG Logical three, or so this is what's coming out later this year, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, we have res we have uh, separated the receiver and the writer process, which is. Uh, is sort of an architectural simplification, but it also makes things faster because then the receiving and the writing can happen in, in sort of in a pipeline way. There's failover support, which I'll explain in a moment. There's some improved error reporting, which I also want to backport to Postgres Core, which is this uh, view down here, 
or table. And, and this is the problem that you have now in, in or with older versions of PG Logical or in Core Postgres if the subscription apply process has, has a failure of any kind. It's, you don't notice that unless you, you know, check the logs all the time. There's no other way a background process can report this. Right? It can just log something and then it will terminate itself, restart, try again, and the only way you really recognize this unless you have really tight uh, log checking is that the replication will then fall behind and you'll have to dig into that. So what this will do is leave the last error in this table, and then you can just kind of monitor that table. So that, that makes it a little bit easier, and you have to don't have to dig into the logs all the time. So if you have some kind of you know a conflict that is not resolved because maybe you set it to error, then that would show up here. So that's kind of neat. Uh, so support for replica identity full. We had the. Um, that does that, that means you don't need a primary key anymore on a table. So normally you need a primary key on a table, and it's still recommended, but you don't need that anymore now. But it's going to be very slow because it the primary key is needed to well you need a key to do the update or the delete. If you if you just do inserts, you don't need a primary key. But if you want to do updates or deletes, it needs a key to find the row to update. And if you don't have a key, then you now have the option to use all the columns as the key. But that, you know, you can think of how this has all kinds of problems in terms of uh, just performance, but also you, that, does not, that doesn't actually guarantee uniqueness. So you can kind of make stuff work. Maybe if you want to run an upgrade, upgrade through this and you really don't have a key, you can kind of work around that now. So one thing that, in, in honesty, so to speak, where PG Logical is actually kind of worse than built-in logical application is the initial table synchronization, which uh, in, in the core Postgres, you know, is, is fully transactional and it's uh, it's on a per table basis, and the table the synchronization of multiple tables is is, is parallelized, so it's it works really well. In PG Logical 3, for a variety of reasons, some of which have to do with the DDL synchronization, it's actually a little bit more complicated. So it's, uh, in, in, in past releases, it was, uh, it was the case that if uh, synchronization failed, you kind of had to do, undo it manually with, you know, to some degree. So that really sucked. Now it's, it, it's more robust. It, it's still... It, it runs everything transactionally, so if there's a failure, it all goes away automatically. But it still runs all in one transaction as opposed to one transaction per table. So you can't parallelize it as easily as you, uh, uh, the in-core facilities have. So that's a bit of a difference in terms of how, how these work. All right. So one other neat aspect uh, or, or some additional functionality that came out of the separation of the, of the uh, the receiver and the writer is now there's different writers. So what, what does that mean? Right? The, de the default way of, well, the default behavior of the apply process is, well, it takes the row and it sticks it into the table. And it does that on a, on a, a quite low C level, right? It, it sort of pokes into the executor and it inserts a row into the heap and updates indexes and runs some triggers. So it's some low level C code that does it, right? It's always done it. So that, that's what you want normally. But you can also do different things with the row. And, and one option is that you use what is called the SPI writer, which calls uh, SPI. For those of you who don't exactly know what SPI is, it's an internal, an, an internal, S, an internal API in the Postgres backend that allows you to run SQL inside the Postgres backend. So, Instead of using low-level C APIs to stick stuff into a table, you can also just construct an insert command or an update command and run through SPI, which effectively does the same thing, but it's going to be much slower. So you, you don't want to use that if you can just use the other way, but this allows you to then write into not just a straight into the heap, but it allows you to write into anything that kind of looks like a table. And these are sort of examples down here, right? So anything you can run an insert or an update command on, you can use that to write into it. So you can write, uh, replicate into a view if you 
if the view is updatable or, or insertable. You can replicate into partition tables, meaning you, can rep you could replicate into the partition root and then the, par then the normal mechanisms will route it. So if you have a non-partition table, you can replicate it that into a partition table and it will then do its thing, which is currently not otherwise possible. Or you can even replicate into foreign tables if you have a foreign data wrapper that's, that's writable. You can then basically replicate into anything you want. And there are some use cases that you know, I've become aware of that you want to replicate into something that's not Postgres. I don't know why anyone would want to do that, but it's now possible, right? So you can replicate in, I don't, not totally up to date on what the writability of different for, for data wrappers is, but conceivably you could just replicate into some other, you know, competing SQL product or replicate maybe even into like, you know, a file or things like that that exists, right? So anything's possible now and, and also things like Postgres XL or, you know, any of these similar products, I, I am not exactly, I know Postgres XL works, but probably CIDAS, Screenplum, stuff like that. Anything that looks like a table, you can replicate into that. Obviously super useful if you want to replicate from a so a transactional environment to some analytics environment that uses a different kind of product. So that's all possible now. Again, not super fast, but it's possible. One question I've received in this context before is can you replicate the other way around from a non-Postgres product into Postgres? Maybe, but not using this, right? Because this relies on logical decoding and, and, and core Postgres facilities to pull out changes, and then this allows you to put the changes somewhere else, but the other way around, you would need to have a different piece of software that, that's not this, right? so that doesn't exist. All right. Um, so that's the SBI writer list, because that was too much fun. We just wrote a bunch of other writers, too. Um, so there's a Kafka writer, which writes into not a table, but into Kafka. and. Uh, so instead of, you know, you give it an option, you use the same sort of subscription and you tell what replication set, so maybe some tables or maybe not other tables, or maybe even filtered by column or row, you can do that all here, and then you just give it a different writer name and you give some connection information here. And then it doesn't write it into a table, it writes it off to your Kafka environment. And there, there have been other systems that do this, that use, you know, a, you, it's not super hard to do this yourself, uh, to, to write a decoding output plugin that does this. So, you know, this is not like sort of brand new functionality, but if you're already using PG Logical and you want some of this filtering and all that stuff, you can use all the same setup and management and then use, and use this ad additional functionality, right? So if you already have this, then you have new options now, right? Um, so, and if you want to use RabbitMQ, it's the same thing. So, that's also available. Uh, so, slide sidebar, which is not in the, in the slides here, but we were just talking uh, like an hour ago with some people. Uh, you, if you want to do sort of queuing in Postgres, you could really do that with some of these facilities because there there's also something called a, a generic wall message, which means there's a there's a a function PG logical emit message, which allows you to write essentially an arbitrary piece of string or byte A into the wall. And then PG logical or any other output plugin that supports that would decode that and allow you to do something with that and then potentially feed it into a RabbitMQ or whatever you want with it. So if you have use cases, like this is not, I just kind of made that up in the last hour or two, but if you have use cases that kind of call for queuing inside the database, and maybe if you use PGQ in the past or you're looking into something like that, then maybe think about this as well, because that might help you also, and it's maybe a little bit of a, a more modern and maintained piece of software that you can also use for other things. So just a thought there. Okay, so. Failover support, this is uh, uh, quite important. So what, until now, if you have a physical replication pair, right, just your normal 
master and then the standby for just general availability. And you have a, a logical replication hanging off the master for archiving or analytics or anything like that. Until now, if you do a failover here, then your logical replication connection is, is or your logical replication setup is, is dead and broken, and you'll have to set it up from scratch because the logical replication information is not actually replicated over the physical replication stream, right? So this is kind of a triangle that I'm drawing into the air here. And so this is this is clearly bad. And those of you who are sort of following hackers and stuff, they have seen various patches being proposed that have been named failover slots and things like that. And they were quite contentious and then don't exist in any core Postgres version. Somehow through the magic of the developers who are involved in this, they have now figured out how to do this without any changes in core Postgres. So essentially PG Logical ensures that the replication information is synchronized over the physical replication stream and the information is now there if you are using Postgres 10. So this is not going to work with 9.6 and before, but in Postgres 10 it just works out of the box now. So it, you don't need any failover slot patches or anything like that if you have ever looked into that. So that's now solved, hopefully. Is there documentation for that? Um, there, I mean, PG Logical has documentation, so this, I, this is, in a way, this just works now, but I, there's no specific setup you have to do, unlike the failover slot. The failover slot feature kind of was a, a variant of a replication slot where you explicitly had to tell this is a failover slot, or this is a replication slot with this additional attribute, and then things would happen. In this case, you don't have to do anything in addition, but it's it's documented, but I don't. There, there's nothing really you have to do. It just it just in principle just works, right? All right. So this is a kind of a the pros and cons kind of uh, list here. So PG Logical is it works for older versions. So this is also useful if you want to just do an upgrade from 9.4 or newer to most recent versions. Uh, row and column filtering, as I explained, some DDL support, sequence replication, truncate replication with the asterisk that truncate replication now also works in Postgres 11. So that was a new, a new, a new feature in, in Postgres 11, or is, will be, I guess, depending on where you are, sort of in the death cycle. And conflict resolution and failover support and then truncated down there is the SPI, SPI write option. So those are all kind of additional features and, you know, again, we, we want to kind of push all of that stuff into, into core Postgres eventually as sort of time and community processes permit. But if you kind of have interest in any of these kind of functionalities, you can sort of take a look in there and, and see how they work or even contribute to um, backporting them or whatever, however you want to describe it. So again, if you ever, you know, PG Logical source code is on GitHub. If you ever look into it, it looks very similar to what's in, in core Postgres in terms of structure. So there shouldn't be a, a whole lot of effort to kind of get started with it. Okay. Any questions on BDR, uh, PG Logical before I get into BDR briefly? Question on uh, does it support Kafka what? Like, to Kafka, yeah. Kafka. Kafka. Yeah. Okay, the question is when you do this, does it support yeah. Kerberized Kafka? I think there is probably a, a lack of support for all the different, I know you can do a lot of things when you connect to Kafka in terms of SSL and certificate validation and even Kerberos and stuff. That I, I would probably guess that that might not work, but it probably wouldn't be a whole lot of work to make it work. You just have to, you know, a few more options here. This basically, there's a library behind this. Obviously, this is not, doesn't do it all by itself. There's a library librd kafka behind this. 
And in, in a way, most of these options are just passed through, and we could add more. So if this is a necessity, I think it could easily be added, right? But we're not, I mean, there's sort of some of these uses of, of sort of advanced SSL options and Kerberos options, they're, they're not, you know, not the first on the list to do, but it could quite, quite likely be done. Okay. So BDR is what started all this mess many years ago. Um, it's a, you know, the name kind of stuck somehow. It was kind of more of a, a prototype name in a way, but it's a multi-master replication system for Postgres multi-master asynchronous. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's been around for a while and it, it works, so um, perhaps not well known. I, I know yesterday people talked about we should have multi-master for Postgres. In, in a way, it's been around for a while. So the original use case, uh, it's again a little bit truncated, the original use case for it was this sort of geographically distributed use case. Because um, you, know, you, you, ha you have this situation where you, you put a database in you know, one location, you build your app and put your whole stack on top of it, and you have you know, intra-data cent data center latency of you know, a few milliseconds, and that's great. And then when you grow and you start building front ends in different, app, uh, replica, uh, in different locations, maybe not even across the world, maybe just a few on the, on the continent, on different coasts, right? You will then have latency between your maybe your your application server or web server and the database of you know, hundreds of milliseconds or more, just because of the the physics involved. And uh, people build all kinds of queuing and caching on top of things to to hide that, which you know obviously has worked fine because that's how the internet works. But you know the the proposal is to have a better option of just putting databases in different locations and then have you know, local latency and then have the databases synchronize themselves. And again, this does not work for all applications and there's issues with this, so it's not one thing that works for everybody and there's a whole, not gonna go into all the details of what's better or worse and, and how to do this. This would be a, another talk or tutorial even. So that's just a, a note that this is, you know, we think Useful for many people, but it's not a universal solution. What would also happened is that a lot of people try to use this not for that, but also as an HA setup. And um, in, initially, uh, so you would basically have two, you know, you put them in the same data center or maybe at least not across the world, different availability zones, maybe that's how we term it nowadays. And then you just write to one, but if there's a failover event, you don't have to do any promotion or anything. You just start writing to the other because it's already up and, and fully qualified as a master. And that did not work well with old BDR versions. So basically what we did is try to like fix that, and, and now that use case works. So those are the two use cases we try to support. All right, so this is the version history of this. Um, the version one, which is the one out now, is uh, works on a, a, a slightly patched Postgres 9.4 plus a plugin on top of that. The version two um, was then only a plugin because all the again, as I mentioned, bunch of features that were written for this were then merged back into Postgres. And then at some point, then we reached this, the state where we didn't need to patch Postgres anymore. For, for various reasons, uh, Postgres, uh, BDR2 was then sort of not widely published um, because essentially the decision was made to, you know, at that point we would have had to support sort of three or four different code bases of logical application because at the same time we were also working on Postgres 10. And so ultimately, you would have to have you know, three, four branches, and there's only so many resources for that. So basically, two tracks of, BD, two tracks of BDR, Core Postgres, and PG Logical. That's kind of, if you want to think about it that way. So it was then basically decided to not sort of publish that further. Uh, second Quadrant customers are using that. But the decision was then made to basically rewrite BDR 
as an extension on top of PG Logical. And that's what we're currently um, focusing on. So, and in, in a way, this makes a lot of sense because PG Logical can provide the transportation layer in a sense. Because PG Logical's job is to get data from here to there, and that's all it does. And then you have BDR on top of that, which does sort of node coordination and, and, and some raft stuff and things like that, right? And then it just sort of is an abstraction on top of multiple PG Logical subscriptions. So if you just have two nodes, you will have a sub underneath it. You don't really see that. Underneath it, you have one PG Logical subscription going that way and one going that way, roughly speaking. But BDR sits on top of that and abstracts that away and just says this is just a node group. Right. So this is, I, you know, that's an architecture I think it's much easier to work with and develop for, but also reduces the number of code bases we have to maintain because now we basically only have to worry about Peach Logical doing its data shipping and BDR. It doesn't have a whole, a whole other copy of doing this and a whole other protocol and, and all these views to manage that so you don't have to have that anymore. Okay. So the way this looks, if you set it up, is very similar. Again, you need to set wall level, load two shared libraries in this case, and um, set commit uh, timestamp tracking to on if in, in most likely. Great extension, again, but the cascade is useful here because it depends on PG Logicals. So it would pull that in automatically. Maybe we should do cascade as the default because there's a lot of application uh, extensions now that require another extension and there's no real reason not to pull those in if you want that, right? Maybe it's something to think about. And then there's a bunch of commands to set this up. It, you know, again, I just kind of alluded to that. You, you create a node group and have nodes join and it does some raft stuff underneath. And then underneath it basically sets up a bunch of PG logical replication sets and subscriptions and stuff like that. In version three, I'll be, the commands look the same in version one and two, they just do different things underneath. So there's, there's, well, there is kind of the default idea is there's only one replication set. You can do a couple of variants of this, but so the normal way to do is you just have one replication set and then you include the tables you want. So you don't have to replicate everything, but the best way to do it is to put all the things you do want to replicate into one replication set. There is DDL support, and this has changed a fair amount between version one, two, and three. But you know, m most DDL commands are replicated automatically. And there, there are some that just because of some internals having to do with event trigger stuff and business like that, some commands are not captured by that, such as uh, create user commands, I believe, and that sort of thing. But the normal, like, if you create a table here, it will automatically appear everywhere else. If you drop a column off the table, it will automatically appear everywhere else. So that sort of normal behavior is, is taken care of. Um, and there, there is also this explicit way of, say, you want to do a specific, just a, any command, really. You want to run that on all nodes. Maybe you have some maintenance procedure or some weird stuff. You can also do that. So that's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it, it works pretty well. But just because of the way various Postgres internals work, it's not sort of a 100% a solution. You still have to kind of handhold it a little bit, but the basic idea is that, you know, if you just sort of create a schema, create some tables and a couple of views, it'll, it'll all replicate automatically. Um, so another tricky business in these various iterations of VDR has been how to handle sequences, because um, you want to be able to write on multiple nodes, right? That's the whole idea. And so you need to some way to partition the sequences. So if you use a number here, it's not already used there. And there have been various, again, if you've been following hackers over the last several years, there have been various attempts at doing this. One of the attempts was labeled um, sequence access methods, if you've ever seen that. That was sort of an idea to do that. And in a way, we've given up on doing it the complicated way. And there is now a, in BDR3, a, um, so basically BDR1 kind of used 
uh, Apache Postgres that did something like the secret access methods BDR2 two kind of just use kind of offsets of different sequences, but BDR3 kind of has what I, what I believe is sort of a, a good and s quite simple solution. So you can you can choose for each sequence whether you want to just be a local sequence and then it's just a local call and maybe you have conflicts or maybe you don't. That's up to your setup. Or you can make it a time short sequence and that kind of uses uh, this... Um, a way of creating sequence numbers that uses a, a, the node ID, a timestamp, and then a, a, attach a local sequence. You might have seen this elsewhere, and it's, it's a, sort of a, an ad hoc standard in a sense. It's also some, sometimes called KSU ID, or there's some, you know, sort of an ad hoc standard, but it, it works just fine. You know, obviously the node ID is in there, so it's distinct anyway. And you put the timestamp in there so that it's it still kind of sorts. So if you assign a number here and you assign a number here, if you just have the node ID, you still get distinct numbers, but they will, you know, they won't. All the sequences from one node will sort before the sequences of the other node, which it's not wrong, but it's sort of more convenient if they would kind kind of sort in the in the order they were assigned. So that's why they put the timestamp in there. And you can just kind of pick that and it. it does some uh, some uh, sort of plan tree rewriting in the background to make this work, but it uses all official Postgres hooks to do this. So that there, this is a, a exclusively an, it's an exclusively an extension, right? It doesn't do any sort of deep hacking. It uses normal hook points to do this. So one of the good things about what is what about conflict resolution in BDR? Well, it doesn't do anything about it. It just does what PG Logical does. So that's one of the advantages of this new architecture. But it does have the exact same facilities for you know doing first update wins, last update wins, local wins, remote wins, whichever you want to do. It's the same idea. Okay. All right, we're landing just on the time here. So. When and where and how is all this going to happen? The current versions which are out there are PG Logical 2. It's open source. It's on GitHub. You can use it. It's in use. BDR1 is, again, is, all, is open source. It's on presumably GitHub or at least on the second quarter web page. Um, but that, you know, that requires you to use a patched Postgres 9.4, so that's probably a, 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 an expiring solution there. Uh, so, when I originally wrote this, they told me that uh, this would be available to for internal customers as uh, today. Apparently, I haven't phoned home to see if that actually happened. But uh, so this is, is sort of ready, but we're rolling it out internally first. And uh, PG Logical three will be open source later this year. There's currently no timeline for when BDR3 is going to be open sourced or sort of published further. Uh, we're kind of working that out, but probably not in the next couple of months, so don't expect that. But if you're you know, interested in doing uh, some business with us, I guess you could talk to us about that. So that's the end of that. We've sort of just hit the, the end of the time here. Um, so again, you can you know, you, you know feel free to try these out and play with some of these. And uh, if you are sort of interested in where technology is going, you can look at PG Logical three or you know ask me in the meantime and uh, maybe have time for one or two questions. Or otherwise, just you know see me later at the social event. Maybe David, please yes. So the question is about well, how do you, if you have backups and you need to restore both nodes, and what do you do then, right? I mean, the, the way we really want to roll this out with BDR is not just two nodes, but each node, each logical node would also have physical standbys. That is what we would recommend. So you would have sort of more of, on the order of six or seven nodes really to support all of this if you want to have real HA. So 
you, you, you're not really going to. But because of the failover support that I explained, this would work if you if you do a, a failover between your logic uh, between your physical pair, the logical information would travel with it. I don't think it's going to. I don't think it travels into the backup, so that is probably not going to work smoothly, depending on exact some details. But it, that's. I don't think that works. <clears throat> All right. I think we're out of time anyway. Thank you.